makes it really unique in a way that others are not. So uh, what makes Jerusalem unique? Well, what makes Jerusalem unique is, by the way, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So what makes Jerusalem unique is that it's both located on a mountain, which is a huge strategic advantage if you're afraid of being invaded. And what's the problem with cities that are located on mountains? Why doesn't everyone come up with that genius idea? Why doesn't everyone uh, put themselves on a mountain? Does anyone uh, know why Jerusalem uh, is, uh, why being on a mountain is so unique? Well, because if you're on a mountain, you usually don't have water. And Jerusalem is very unique in the sense that it both is on a mountain and it has water. So really water is what makes Jerusalem an amazing city that's able to surround itself with walls and yet, uh, not die from thirst. We'll see that people trusted that a lot. Uh, and now, um, a lot of people think of the old city. When, when, when you think of the old city, what are you thinking about? Well, you're thinking about the Chorba Synagogue. You're thinking about uh, maybe Yeshiva Takota. Those are not actually the old city. Those are very modern, so to speak. Those are from the time of uh, much later on in history, some of them often the, the past four or 500 years. The real old city of Jerusalem, this was what was discovered in the past 150 years, the real old city of Jerusalem is actually not even in the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And that's what we're gonna see today. We're gonna see the real old city of Jerusalem. And I will not even begin with the Kotel tunnels because I'm gonna start with you 4,000 years ago in the time of the Canaanites uh, and show you really many things that uh, you have not seen. I assure you, I actually assure every person here today, you will see things that you've never seen before, even if you've been to Jerusalem many times. All right, so we're gonna start with uh, a digging tunnel of Jerusalem. This is a picture uh, I took on a trip. I went there with my grandmother. Um, this is what's called the Canaanite wall. Um, if you go outside Shar HaAshpot in Jerusalem, uh, there's an area, obviously today it's very famous, it's the city of David. Uh, and it's outside the walls of the old city. And many of the structures and many of the tunnels that are there are not even from the time of King David. They are from the Canaanites. So it's actually interesting if you Google or try to find out what the oldest city in the world is that's still residential today. Some of the top two are Jerusalem and Jericho. Jericho is a bit older, but Jerusalem is actually one of the oldest, probably top five oldest cities in the world that are still inhabited today. Uh, this is what the Canaanites used to use to carve, and we're going to see there was a lot of carving. The amazing things about uh, thing about Jerusalem is that you can stand in the same spot and dig, and even if you'll find something, there's always something beneath it to, to look for again. So this is the uh, this is what the the axles that they would use, and here we go down this shaft now. What's amazing about this shaft again is that it was discovered much later in history and it was discovered, at, it, it's part of a Canaanite system, meaning the city is so old that the Canaanites already made it into a fortress. It was already surrounded with walls and uh, had deep, deep tunnels. You know, you say Yerushalayim Harim Saviv La, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily you know, the harim are not necessarily saviv to, let's say, where uh, Ben Yehuda is today. It's really surrounding the area, that, uh, the, the area that's here, the city of David, because it's a bit lower than Har HaMoria and, and where you have the modern old city. All right, here I am right there in the uh, Canaanite area. Um, some people left their stuff behind. When Charles Warren, uh, we're going to learn about him. He's a British excavator sent by Her Majesty the Queen in about 1870 uh, to ex excavate Jerusalem. By the way, I'll tell you a little secret. She also sent him to explore and uh, to snoop so that if they want to conquer it from the Ottomans, uh, they know what's going on. Uh, so some of these, these people, they left their stuff and you see the equipment of archaeologists who began digging here 150 years ago. Some of them left their stuff behind. Here he is uh, Sir Charles Warren. He's a British fellow, and he's the one who really we owe so much of this to, because he's the one who said, I am not going to start digging in the old city inside the walls. I'm going to start digging based on the Bible, uh, close to where the water was going, to the Kidron Valley, 
And he's really the one who said, guys, you're looking in the wrong places. Uh, and and he, he's the one who dug up this shaft. That's why it's called to this day, Warren's shaft. If any of you have seen uh, recently, also there's Robinson's arch. These two fellows, Warren and Robinson, did a lot in terms of figuring out the, the, the preliminary digging. Uh, here's a painting of, of the, the, what they went out to find in those days. Uh, so they discovered this, this whole world un, under Jerusalem. Now, here's a fantastic pasuk because it really is not read this way by any of the commentaries, but Warren used this pasuk to, to discover the shaft. So <clears throat> I don't know who you're going with which commentary, but Warren uh, said, he looked at this pasuk and he's like, I know how I'm going to find the city. So he discovers it in 1878. It says about King David conquering Jerusalem. The king and his people go to Yerushalayim to the Yevusi. He's told, to, David is told, The only way to conquer the city is if you remove the blind and the uh, cripple. Now, what city has blind and crippled people uh, protecting it? You tell me, who do you think has blind and crippled people protecting their own city? I mean, it doesn't seem like a, a strategy that, that it will work. But because Jerusalem was so fortressed, the only way to come in was through these tunnels. By the way, the, the Metsudat Zion, the fortress of Zion, is not where you have uh, the Tower of David. It's where you have this old city, where the city of David is today, he or David. Anyone who wants to strike the Yevusim, now, Tsinor usually means a tower or, or passageway, but um, Mr. I don't know honestly how this is translated in the King's James, King James Bible, but Mr. Warren looks at the Bible and he says, there's a shaft, there's a tunnel to get into the city. And he goes down this shaft and to his misfortune, water starts coming up and he's about to drown and he's holding the, he's holding a candle in his mouth. And he realizes that the candle isn't going out even when the water is rising and he suddenly feels a breeze from above. And he realizes that not only are there these deep wells, but there's a system of shafts. So that is uh, what he found. And this is what's called the Canaanite tunnel. I don't know if any of you, this is a combination by the way of three pictures, but you can see, you know, it's very popular today to visit Chizkiah's tunnel. Chizkiah's tunnel is a modern, structure in comparison, right? So this is something that goes back uh, probably, I don't know, four, 400, at least 400 years uh, before Hezekiah. So you have what's called the Canaanite tunnels and they're going also under the city to the, the spring of water and, uh, and, and up into the city. And so Mr. Uh, Sir, I should say, Sir Warren assumes that this is how uh, King David conquered the city. Um, all right, here's a, 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 another one of these shafts. So remember, to conquer the city, this more reminds you of this tsinor, the ability to uh, to go in through the pipe. All righty. Now, here's a story um, I think some of you might recognize. When do you read? Well, I'm not going to quiz anyone. But uh, if you're familiar, anyone familiar with the story of King David appointing his son Shlomo uh, to, be, to be the king when, when, when there's a, a sort of a contentious situation? Um, there's Adoniah ben Chagit who's saying, I'll be king. Does that have to sound familiar to anybody? Well, sure. either. Yes. OK, good. Uh, so either way, uh, King David is about to die, and he says, I'm going to appoint my son Shlomo to be king. And so what do you do to make someone king back in the day? You put oil on them. You put oil on them, but in Jerusalem, you do it at the pool, at the water. And Jerusalem is lucky to have the Gihon spring. Gihon is the name of the spring of water that brings water to Jerusalem. 
And so that's where all the business of the town happens. Remember all the stories in Bereshit that happen near the well? Well, in Jerusalem, everything happens near the pool of water. That's why we have Simchat Beit HaShoi Vah. We're going to see more about that soon. Um, so, Vayomer HaMelech David, King David says, Kiruli le tzadok ha-kohen u le natan ha-naviu le b'nayau ben Yehoyada. Please call me tzadok the kohen, natan the prophet, and general b'nayau ben Yehoyada. Vayavo lifne ha-melech. And now he says the following. Vayomer ha-melech lahem. The king tells them, Kru imachem et avdei adonichem. Take all the servants. Vahir kavtem et shlomo b'ni al-hapir da'asher li. Take shlomo on the uh, mule that I have. You should take him down to the Gihon spring. So that's where you should anoint him to be a king, Al Israel. Remember that he says go down, because to go anywhere to the Gihon, you still have to go down. Even though it has the Jerusalem has the advantage of the Gihon, you still have to go down to get the water. And that brings us to the next. Uh, the next slide. It's hard to see it. It's called the Brecha HaKnanit. It's from the time of the Canaanites. It's right under the uh, palatial area of, of the palace that's attributed to King David. And uh, it's dug by the Canaanites. And so uh, there's no 100% proof. There's hardly ever 100% uh, knowledge in archaeology. Do our, you know, we piece things together. But this is called the Canaanite pool. And some say there's a good chance this is where King Solomon was anointed. We're going to see soon that when Chizkiah dug his tunnel, it drained all the water out of this. All right. Now, here's a good visual of why I was telling you uh, that the city of the old city we have today is not even the old city. So if you see the topography here and you see what's going on, the top here is the Beit HaMikdash. In fact, when King David had this area, uh, it was not even uh, very much walled from the city, from, from the north, meaning the, the, the city was most vulnerable from the north. So quickly, let's take a look here. So we know, so this, by the way, for those wondering, this area called Hagiva Maravit or Har Tzion, this is where uh, the old city is today. Then you have this valley. Anyone ever go to the Kotel? and have to go down the stairs from the old city? Anyone ever go down the walls from, down the stairs from the old city to the Kotel? Well, that's because you're going down this area to the valley. The Kotel is basically the valley that is right before the actual old city of Jerusalem from the time of the first temple. Uh, and so this city of David is under the Beit HaMikdash to the south. And you have on the eastern side of the city, the Gihon Spring. And back in the day, you're going to have to know this later when we read the story of Tzidkiyahu. Back in the day, the spring would go in here, actually very convenient, and pour into this valley. So you were able to plant all your grapes and your whatever you wanted to plant, you would plant in this valley on the east. Uh, so that is, uh, that's, uh, and, and the water would come down here. Oh, sorry. The water would come to the Shiloh pool. Uh, so you had the Shiloh pool at the south, you have Nachal Kidron, all these places are mentioned many times in the book of Melachim. During the second temple, the, the old city included also, the whole city of Jerusalem included also the western side. All right, now we skip a few hundred years forward, past King David, King Solomon, the days of Chizkiyahu. Chizkiyahu does something, by the way, if you look at the Gemara, the Talmud, the rabbis criticize him for, for this, but King Chizkiyahu is a very good guy, and uh, he sees that the king of Ashur, the Assyrian king, who has, by the way, already decimated the northern kingdom of Israel, he hears that he's coming to Jerusalem. Now, what advantage does he have that Israel didn't have, that the, the northern kingdom didn't have? He has the walls of the old city. But he says, look, if they come and the, the spring of water is outside of the city, then they'll just be able to park there forever. And so he decides to do something that changes history and changes the very physical geography, topography of Jerusalem. Uh, so, Chizkiyahu sees that Sancheriv is coming and he's headed to war on Jerusalem. He speaks to his heroes and he decides to plug 
all the city springs, all the springs of water that are right outside of the wall, by Azru, by Kavtu Amrav, the, all these people gathered with him, by Istemuit Kola Mayanot, they close up all the wells, that uh, all the springs, I should say, that Hanachal Ashotef Betocharetz. And now here's a word that's critical. It's a very, uh, you can hear the spirit, you can hear the heart in this. Why should the kings of Ashur come and find a lot of water? It's very Jewish, right? We, we always answer with a question. So the, they answer, the, they explain what they're doing with a question. Why should the Assyrian kings come and find all of our water? Let's plug it all up. Now, the thing is, if you plug up the water somewhere, it has to come out from another place. And this is where the famous, famous, famous Chizkiyahu tunnel comes. He decides to dig a tunnel that will end up inside the city uh, rather than, uh, rather than um, let the water outside. And this is where you have, by the way, I just I don't know if there are any engineers in the audience, engineers or architects. If yes, please feel free to uh, let us know. But what he did is, by the way, considered one of the most amazing feats engine, from an engineering perspective. And some of the things we don't know to this day how they did it. There's no knowledge of how they did it. Because think about it. You have two groups digging from two sides, opposite sides, in the most, you know, in, in rock, basically. They're not even digging through dirt. And they meet each other in the middle. So can you imagine such a thing? Can you imagine such an engineer, imagine someone digging a subway from two different directions and somehow meeting exactly in the middle. Uh, it's very hard to understand how they did it, not to mention also balancing the levels of steepness in terms of accommodating the water. So that is Chizkiyahu's tunnel. It is mind boggling because it really, uh, it, it, it's just an incredible um, feat from, a, from just a logistical perspective. So um, here is Chizkiyahu's tunnel. They start digging. And in the middle, um, does anyone, by the way, know what's up here on the screen? In the middle, they see this. And it is one of our oldest artifacts. And believe it or not, uh, it's not only for the Egyptians that empires stole archaeological artifacts. We also had people stealing from us. And that is, uh, it's called Chizkiyahu's tablet. It was stolen by the Ottoman Empire. It is sitting today in Istanbul and was in the news recently because Turkey said that as a gesture of goodwill, they may return it. I'm not betting a lot on them returning it, but that's what they said. And uh, it's, it's in the middle of the, the cave, the engineers and the people who are digging suddenly realize that their, their bet came true. And that is that they're about to see one another. So if you go now to the place in Israel, they have a replica. Uh, and it says, if you can, uh, um, you can read it in this place uh, where you're standing, used to be the what's called the Shiloach writing, uh, 2,700 years ago. So this is a replica in Jerusalem of King Chizkiyahu's uh, um, tablet. And here's what it says. He, it, it, by the way, it was not easy to figure out what it says. That in and of itself was something. Uh, but you can feel the emotion in these words. You can really think about the excitement. Again, let me just, uh, I'm going to show with my hands just so everyone understands. Just realize that you have two groups who are digging in the thick of the rock under extraordinary time crunch because the war is about to come. And they're digging in the direction of one another. And there are so many ways they can miss each other to the right, to the left, up, down, angles. And they suddenly, after days of digging, they hear in the, in, in, in the midst of this uh, digging, in the, deep down in the ground, they hear the axes of their friends, of the other team, so to speak. And th th they're overjoyed because they realize that it's gonna, th it's gonna work. I'll just tell you guys another interesting thing that we don't know until this day. Nobody knows to this day how they were able to do it and keep a fire on where there is no other passage for air. Uh, so nobody knows how they were able to have the breathing, the light, all that going in a place that's in the depths of the ground with absolutely no entrance 
uh, no ventilation systems. So that's another mystery. One mystery is how they got to each other from an engineering perspective. The other is how did they dig without flashlights? You know, the, there's limited oxygen down there. They all need to breathe. And how, how were they able to do that? So uh, that's another very interesting thing. And here's what they type. I shouldn't say type, sorry. This is what they carve in the stone uh, when they're looking at, uh, when they hear one another. This is the end of our hewing and, and digging in. This is uh, the story of this tunnel. While the, uh, the people who are, are doing the digging are uh, raising their axes, one towards the other, when they were just three amot from penetrating and reaching one another, you heard the voice of one person, by the way, you see they went from one line to the other in the middle of a word, uh, um, calling to each other. By the way, there is a, a whole discussion of what the next word means in this context. Zada Zada usually means like Zadon, means intentionally. They had one axe hit the other. Now you imagine all the water bursting through. The water went to the source, from the source, El Habrecha, to the pool, the Shiloach pool. Friends, you are looking now at the birth of the Shiloach pool. The water gushed through the tunnel, now that the diggers met each other, it, it, it was 1,200 amot, cubits, and the, the rock above those digging is 100 amot, so they're 100 amot under the ground, and they're digging and they meet each other and the water goes through. It's, it's an incredible planning. Um, all right, so now that, that is the pool of, uh, that is the tunnel of Chizkiyahu. Um, and that leads you out to a pool that used to be inside the city. Remember, they don't want the king of Assyria to meet it. So there's a place called the Shiloh pool. Now we're gonna see soon, this is not the only component of the Shiloh pool. I don't wanna be a spoiler, but um, we're going to see there's a much fancier side to the Shiloh. Um, and yeah, this is the Shiloh. And uh, anyone ever see the paintings of Machon HaMikdash or the fancy Machzorim? Anyone ever see those uh, Machzorim with beautiful paintings of the Beit HaMikdash? Uh, they have them for Yom Kippur. They have them for Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot. Um, anyhow, if you look at the Sukkot one, this is the essence of the holiday of Sukkot. You draw water from the Shiloach and bring it to the Beit HaMikdash. You draw water. Ushavtem, when we say every Saturday night, Ushavtem mayim besason mimaynei ha-Yeshua. You should draw water with joy. That was the theme. You brought water from the Shiloach. You brought water from this pool and you brought it up to Jerusalem. So this is really the new heart and center of Jerusalem. We're, we'll see how in the second temple, it, it, it gained a whole new level of life. Um, so that is this part. You can see this is a picture from a hundred years ago. There's different stages. This is now, but this is again, the less fancy side of the Shiloh pool. Uh, then there's a bigger side. That's uh, me when I uh, used to be younger. Uh, and uh, y y we're gonna see that it also served as a, source of water, it was built as a pool. You can see already the, the more round pillars, which are more Greek Roman. Uh, it, it served as a pool for those who do Aliyala Regal, and it served as a gigantic area of gathering. All of the people coming with their sheep, everyone coming to Jerusalem uh, would stop at the bottom at the Shiloh. Now, let me ask everyone a question. In the second temple, or at any temple, frankly, why is the majority of people coming to Jerusalem coming from the south? It would appear to me that, right, that's a strange place. If you know the map of Israel, there's not a huge, the biggest source of traffic to Jerusalem is not necessarily on the south. Anyone have 
ideas of why uh, why it would be on the south. This uh, I'll say is a question that, that struck me just um, just today when I was looking at it. Like, why is everyone coming from the south? But we're gonna see a lot of it has to do with the topography, right? So if there's very tall mountains in the north and you're coming from Jericho or you're coming from, uh, basically it, it, you're coming from the, let's say you're coming from the Golan, the Galil, you still may want to come through the south just in terms of the way uh, the roads are set or people coming from across the Jordan. So yeah, so the, but, but the majority of the traffic is coming from the south of the city. Um, so here's this, this pool that they would all gather at. Uh, let me just put it back up. Um, here, sorry. So here's the pool that, that everyone's gathering at. Ah, this brings me to a discovery that was made in the past 10 years. That's the amazing thing about Jerusalem, that with every year that goes by, there are new discoveries. And this used to be called Herod's Tunnel, but it's not anymore. Why? Because there is a new place that was uncovered and it was covered in 2019. It's very new. It won an award, the Oscar Award for Archaeological Diggings. Uh, I honestly don't know the name of it, but it's called Derech uh, Ovrei HaRegel. Someone made the connection and found that if you dig all the way down, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of feet south of uh, south of Har Habayit, you, you'll see the Shiloh, obviously, right? So um, you, you might see the Shiloh. And all the way from the pool, the people who were going on a pilgrimage, the people who were going on Aliyala Regel, they were all going up through this, this path. It's called Derech Olei HaRegel. Um, and so the idea is that, uh, that you go up and you, I'm sorry, you, you, you um, what do you call it? You, you organize yourself. Um, you, um, I don't know, let's say someone came from, uh, Robert, you came from, uh, give me a name of a city in Israel you would have come from. Let's say you came from uh, Ashkelon. Ash oh, perfect. Ashkelon was more of a Plishti city, but there were times the Jews were there. Uh, definitely during the second temple. So you're coming from Ashkelon. How long do you think it's taking you to walk to Jerusalem with all the sacrifices that you're bringing? So remember, you're not coming on a horse. You're coming with the sheep, right? Weeks. This is, so it's taking you a while. Now, you're not going to walk in to the Beit HaMikdash all exhausted and, and sweaty and unnourished and you're not going to do that, right? You're going to want to stop for a moment, relax. You may not necessarily check into a hotel with all of the sheep that you're bringing as a korban, but uh, you, you're, you're going to want to relax. And that's what you did at the bottom of the derech olei haregel. At the bottom of this road, you would sit. There was this huge pool of water, truly huge. And that's where everyone would gather. You would schmooze. You would meet your cousin from... Uh, Akko, and you would meet your other cousin who's from Gamla. You, you would all gather there to schmooze because you're not going to be schmoozing in the Beit HaMikdash. And uh, you would sort of wash your face, let the sheep drink, and uh, reorganize yourself for this. So there's actually this incredible road which takes you up all the way from the bottom of the, uh, of the um, Shiloh pool, which is south of the Harabai. And it would take you all the way up. Here's a blend. This is actually, I think, one of the most beautiful pictures I've seen. Why? Because it's a mixture of the painting of what was back then and what there is today. So this is a fictional picture. It helps you both understand in terms of what things look like today and also in terms of what things were like back then. So obviously, we all recognize the Kotel here. Uh, you can see the Kotel. But you also see what's called today uh, Robinson's Arch. You see that arch, which, by the way, you can see still pieces of it connected to the wall. Uh, I'll talk about that another time. But uh, that's Robinson's Arch. And this is how everyone used to go up to the Harabite. Everyone. Well, except if you're a Cohen and you have you know, membership privilege. But uh, everyone is going up from the south. You stopped at the pool. 
you drank, you schmoozed, you ate, you're all refreshed, and now you're going up north. You go up north, these are the walls of the old city today, not back then. That's why it's kind of a illustrative picture. It helps you understand it's not realistic in the sense that these walls were not here and the Kotel we're going to see later was, was a bit of a different look. Uh, so yeah, so you're coming up north, you're taking these steps and you're going over Robinson's Arch. Now this, I don't want to call it the Ben Yehuda of Jerusalem because it's a very holy area where they would sell stuff that you might need for the Beit HaMikdash, but there's lots of merchants sitting here. This is like the, uh, I don't know, what do we call it? The Fifth Avenue, uh, whatever it is, it's, you know, the, under the arch, that's where we're going to see a lot of the business went on. A lot of the, it, it, it was a combination of Beit HaMikdash business, the people who gave you the change for your money and the people who would buy korbanot for you, et cetera. Um, so this is where you meet all your uh, commerce needs on this road. Um, here you go. Here's another painting as well as, oh, wow, this is really, truly beautiful. If you could take a look, this is also a blended painting. Um, take a look on the left. Look at that pool. Do you see how big it is? That pool is in the extended wall that was around the second temple, second temple of Jerusalem. Um, and, and then you have a mixture. You have some of the wall that, that's there today. But you gather at that pool at the bottom and you get everything you need and you get all the water you need. And then you begin your ascent up the, again, I don't want to call it the Midrachov of Jerusalem, but look what it looks like, right? It's, it, it, you have shops on your right and left. And we're going to see soon, it's quite a posh area. There's a lot of fancy stuff that is actually still being dug up there. Some of the things that they find there are from 2020. Uh, very, very recent stuff on a scope of uh, 4,000 years. Two years ago is actually great. Uh, so yeah, so this is the Shiloh pool. You come up and, uh, and, 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 and th this is called Der Chol Regel. It's a recent discovery. I've never been there. And from this uh, research, I found out there's a lot of stuff I need to do in Jerusalem. All right, here is something they found there. Anyone ever, I, I honestly, I wouldn't necessarily say I did. But anyone ever hear the term shekel tzori? Shekel tzori is the standard. It's the dollar of the area. It's not the golden standard. It's the silver standard. It's from the city of Tyre in Lebanon. And it is what the half a shekel was if you were going to be most precise. And indeed, it's found in that place. So this is like a dollar of those days, a widely recognized standardized coin of silver. Here are things that are dug up. On Derech Olea Regel, anyone want to comment on what they think some of these things are? Anybody want to just look how posh and fancy? Um, anyone want to try and guess or comment on what they think any of these things are? Some more obvious than the other. Robert, we're counting on you again. Well, there's obviously a ring down. Yes, you're, you have a ring with a um, like very Ooh. fancy stone. Um, and uh, you have then the very fancy uh, stone that, that was engraved into a building. Uh, then you have on the top left a table, tabletop, a really nice tabletop. And on the bottom left, you have a bronze uh, lamp. It looks like if, if you stand it up, it looks sort of like the lamp from uh, Aladdin. Um, so these are all things that they found literally on that street. So it's a, it's a very fancy street. Think about the amount of business that happened there, all the trading, all the people from different parts of the world. Jews came to the Beit HaMikdash all the way from Rome, Alexandria, Syria. So this is really a place that has a lot, a lot of stuff going on there. You have the ring. You have, these are also all recent findings. You have the ring. You have the lamp, you have the tabletop, the uh, fancy uh, engraving for a wall. Uh, it's a fancy place. Um, all right, now, uh, now we're gonna come to a place that, that, by the way, does anyone have questions? Because that brings us to the conclusion of that whole segment. I don't know if you noticed, but I took you down both in terms of timeline and in terms of geography, right? So we saw the very top is the city of David, the palace of David. Uh, then you have the tunnels, Warren's shaft, you have eventually um, uh, Tzidkiyahu's tunnel, Tzidkiyahu Chizkiyahu's tunnel, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the Shiloach pool, Derech Oleha Regel, the road of the people going up on the 
Aliyah Regal to Jerusalem. And finally, you have the, um, uh, the, the pool at the bottom. All right, this brings us to a place in Jerusalem. Actually, do you have a question? If yeah. people were going up on Robinson's Arch, what are the stairs on the southern side for? Who went up those stairs? On the, so you know what? Let me bring up the picture so we all understand what you're asking and uh, we can uh, properly look at it. Um, one second. Just a half a second. I don't know what's going on. One second. Um, just give me a half a second so I can bring it up. It's for some reason not. Uh, all right, here we go. Oh, so here we go. This is, um, this is it. Here we go. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, I don't know why it's not sharing. Um, sorry. All right. Um, so again, if you just while I'm bringing it up, do you mind explaining? There's there's a, a large set of stairs, and there used to be arches, which were entryways into the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering who went in there. If you're saying everybody went in through Robinson's Arch, and is that on the on the northern side or the uh oh my sense of direction is horrible right, they're still there to this to Got this it. day they're still there so taking a look at this picture are you able to see what you're referring to right so where your arrow is to the right of that oh to the to the you mean the southern wall where you have a lot of yes okay right good it's question. not in the picture excellent you know what that's such a good question um first of all the answer is i don't know in a definite way but I will say that down here, you have many, 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 like an extraordinary amount of mikvahs, right? So this is where you have right. all the purification parts. Uh, so it's possible this was more for Kohanim. Uh, it's more for the priests. Uh, but you're right. There is an entrance from the south. Um, there is an entrance from the south. Now, if you take a look at Derech Olea Regal here, it splits. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you come up this road, you must go up Robinson's Arch. You see, you can go both ways. And that's, by the way, the, the, the very beautiful area they have now open um, on, on the south, on the south uh, west corner. Um, but yeah, you can, you can probably go either way. And frankly, you can also continue straight. We're going to see soon in terms of the Kotel tunnels and a lot of that, that you can go straight, even though that was more for Kohanim and, and stuff like that. It was more exclusive. Um, oh, does that make somewhat sense? Yep. Yes, thank you. Okay, so yeah, but you're right. There is the option of going through both through the Robinson's Arch and also on the southern wall, there's there's these doors. And uh, but I feel like those doors may have been more for like specific purposes, whether it's Kohanim or people who just went in the mikvah or uh, things like that. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the Oh, you know what? If you take a look in this painting, somewhat in the middle, they have those gates. Do you see those gates on this painting? Here, um, right there, do you see that? Yep. Yeah, so you're right, there is that option. And, and, and this is, uh, there's all these uh, uh, mikvahs down there. Um, all right, good point. Uh, okay, now I'm here to tell you that one place is not what you think it is. There's an area called uh, uh, Tzidkiyahu's Tunnel. Uh, and uh, some people call it Mitz Solomon's quarries, but we'll see that neither place really has uh, the archaeological uh, val validity. Um, the book of Melachim too says at the very end, before the destruction of Jerusalem, famous story, The city was in siege at the 12th year of Tzidkiyahu, which is the month of Av, there was no bread. The wall was um, penetrated, which is why we fasted. Everyone escapes, and they come, uh, they, they all run away through this area in the night, 
and Bayer de Fuchel Kasdima Haram Melech, Bayer Sigur Tzitkiel Bayer Boti Arechel. For some reason, there, between a mixture of different things, there's this belief that Tzitkiel ran away through a tunnel. Now, of course, there's the option of running away through a tunnel because you have Chizkiel's uh, tunnel, but uh, this big cave, which is near Shar Shem, which is phenomenally huge, um, is not necessarily the place he did it, but there is a place near Shar Shem, which is beyond big, and uh, it, it, it is one of the largest caves, and uh, it, it actually even has an independent source of water in it. In the 16th century, people started attributing it to, uh, to the Kiao's escape, uh, but today I think there's some concerts in there, there's kumzitzes, and, and it's just this huge cave. Now I'm gonna take you to a bit of a uh, freaky place, but it has a very good moral. Uh, what do you think this guy in the picture is doing? Does anyone know what he's doing? I hate to say this. Anyone have an idea of what this fellow is doing? No? No one wants to be brave enough and guess? Good, because- He's napping. He's napping. Well, um, he's uh, a bit brave because this is a place called Gay Ben Hinom. Uh, it's to the east of Jerusalem for those of, I'm sorry, to the west of the old city of Jerusalem. For those of you who've been to the Begin Center, uh, or the Brechata Sultan. It's right under Yamin Moshe. It's right under the Begin Center. It's right under the windmill. There's a valley called Gay Ben Hinom. Now, I'll warn you about the place. The reason we have the word Gehinom, which is the Jewish word for hell, is named for this place. So, and its name in, in, in Greek is not much better. It's called the Necropolis, the city of the dead. And this is where they bury the dead. Now, interestingly, it helps if you're learning Mishnah, this really highlights a lot of terms. Um, the way dead people used to be buried, remember, Jerusalem's stone. You don't bury people in ground. Uh, so what they would do is they would bring the body of the dead person into the place where this tourist decided he's going to um, be brave enough to nap. Um, and, he, uh, and, and, and they would dry the body there for a year, a full year. And once the, you have the end of the year, all you would have is bones. And after that, you have what's called likut atzamot, which is a term in halacha, gathering of the bones, meaning they would gather the bones yeah. of that person and put them in a cell that had all of his family members. So for example, you have the term, uh, you ever hear in, in the book of Melachim, they buried him with his fathers. Yeah, that's because they were all in the same cave. Uh, so th this is Gay Ben Hinom, which I told you is, um, it, it's, it's the word Gay Hinom comes from it. So that's, that's gotta be pretty scary. Uh, now, why is this an important place? There's a lot of important things. First of all, it's important because the reason it's called Gay Ben Hinom, which became Gay Hinom, which is the word for hell in Hebrew, is because this is where during the first temple, Jews used to bring their children as human sacrifices to the God of the Baal. It's one of the most egregious sin that people did. And it's one of the reasons the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. So it's called Gei Ben Hinom. It's the Valley of the Dead, Necropolis. It's the place where they buried very important people, but it's also the place where they worshiped uh, the, with the horror of child sacrifice. Now, um, if you take a look past this, you'll see, uh, you see they, they have this indent where they would put the person's head, and then they have these caves uh, for the people there. Now, what's the downside of what people did in Egypt of burying themselves with their treasures? What's the downside of having a burial with all of your most expensive and precious belongings? Is there a downside to that, anyone? The two grave two. robbers? Exactly, grave robbers. So, um, by the time we reach the 1800s, there is nothing left because the grave robbers stole, stole everything, including the bones. Uh, so there's, there's really, there's, there's absolutely nothing left. But uh, this is the site of one of the greatest archaeological findings in our history. And uh, it, it's an amazing finding. And it even has a very contemporary note to it. So the, the, everyone gives up of finding anything here because, uh, you know, there's nothing here. But um, there's a huge finding found, believe it or not, by a 12-year-old who was called the Nudnik. 
Uh, in the 80s, a fellow named Gabi Barkai goes, and there's this kid who's being a nudnik. Uh, and he goes there, by the way, with a woman who today is a, a professor in Pennsylvania. I forget her name. Um, if you ask me afterwards, I'll, I'll find you. What, uh, I'll find it for you. Can anyone make out what it says on this silver amulet, which is the oldest Jewish text to exist? Uh, it's from the time of the first temple. It is way older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can anyone, it, by the way, if you don't know what it says, don't feel bad because it took archaeologists um, decades to figure out what it what it said. Um, does anyone know what this says? Can anyone know? Uh, what is it? Birkat Kohanim. Birkat Kohanim, yes. It is, uh, it, it, it is the oldest Jewish text. Yevarechicha Hashem veishmerecha. Uh, on a silver, a rolled up silver amulet. And it got, um, it, it fell through one of the deep cracks in the ground so that none of the grave robbers were able to take it. And uh, why is this so important? A, it's the oldest Jewish text to exist as, as much as I know. Secondly, it has a contemporary and very recent emotional side to it. Um, I'm going to show you the fellow who discovered it. It's hard not to cry when you watch this. Is everyone able to hear? Yes. שנותיי הראשונות עברו עליי בהונגריה, והמילים העבריות הראשונות שאני זוכר הן מילותיו של אבי שנהג לברך אותי בכל ערב שבת, כשאנחנו חוזרים מבית הכנסת, במילים של ברכת הכוהנים. יברך לך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישא. So that is a, a fellow named, I believe, Gabi Barkan. And uh, did I get his name? No, Gabi Barkai. And he is born, by the way, his uh, name he was born with is Breslauer. Um, he's, he's from Hungary. He's born in Hungary in 1944. And obviously during the Holocaust. And he remembers his father saying to him, the first Hebrew words that he's ever heard are Yevarech Hashem Yishmerecha. He hears it every Friday night. And he then goes on to discover uh, this finding when he's digging there uh, in the 19, late 1970s uh, and then 1980s, uh, helped by a crew, one of which was a, a nudnik, a 12-year-old child. And he sent him to the farthest place he can because he was bothering him so much. And he said, go over there, go look over there. There was nothing really there. And the kid looked between the cracks and eventually he finds the stash, which includes uh, this Yevarecha Hashem Vishmercha, the oldest uh, Jewish text we, we know of. So it's very emotional in the sense that uh, it's both old and uh, you have it as this fellow's uh, uh, father's, um, you know, the, the words that he heard from him in Hebrew. Now we come to what I call the modern era. And the modern era is the Kotel Tunnel. So the Kotel Tunnels are actually very, very modern. Uh, and I'm going to try and show you things that you did not know. So we, we saw the Kotel. Now, if you continue, uh, this is Wilson's Arch. Anyone ever see in the Kotel? By the way, if you want, you can go. There's a camera live on, on the Kotel 24 hours a day, not seven days a week, not on Shabbat. But uh, there's what's called Wilson's Arch. Wilson's Arch is if in the men's section of the Kotel. If you go into this like um, indoor area, there's this area called Wilson's Arch. You can watch it even right now if you want on the Kotel live camera. Uh, and it's discovered also by, uh, by Wilson and Warren. You can see here, Shar Warren. Then you have a room here called Cheder Kodesh HaKodashim, which is the room of the Holy of Holies. Why? Because it is, it is the closest you will ever get to the Kodesh HaKodashim, the Holy of Holies. And there's even a synagogue there named for the first rabbi of the Western Wall, Rabbi Getz. Uh, and it is the closest you can ever get to the Kodesh HaKodashim to say a prayer, and uh, that's, that's in there in these tunnels. Obviously, there's a lot of background here. The tunnels were uh, uh, opened with great uh, 
resistance from Palestinians. Uh, they had riots. It was a whole story in the 90s. But uh, yeah, this is uh, that room. Then it goes even deeper. Now, I, I said I would tell you things that I did not know. And so I'm going to tell you right now. If you look at the northwestern side of the Temple Mount, you'll see the oldest part of the, um, the tunnels. And this goes back to the time of Herod. Now, there's a pool here that, believe it or not, is so long that it goes into the basement of a monastery of, uh, of nuns in the old city. It's a huge area, and it's called the Struthion Pool. Uh, and I'm going to show you soon a picture of it. It is, it is incredibly large. And this whole area in general is where the, uh, the Hasmoneans really built many, many levels. Uh, th there was above it something called the Antonia. For those of you who read Josephus, uh, the Antonia is right above this. And the reason Herod digs this is to provide his military fortress controlling Temple Mount with water. So this, this pool is called the Struthion. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of it soon. Not before I show you the largest part of the Kotel. Um, there's a, 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 a rock here that's the largest part, the largest rock. It is a 40-foot rock, one part. I can't even, maybe someone here can tell me how much that might weigh, but it is many, many tons. Okay. I, I don't know how they got it. Anyone know? Do we have someone? It's, it's heavy. That's the bottom line. Uh, and, uh, and, and it just gives you an idea. That the reason I'm showing you this largest rock is, A, because it's an amazing human accomplishment in terms of bringing it to here. And second of all, it shows you that the part of the Kotel that we see is both a small part of the Kotel and a high part of the Kotel. If you dig under the Kotel, which is something people are doing now, uh, you will see there are many, many layers below. The Kotel used to be actually filled up even above that, they filled it up. Uh, inside it, there's the synagogue, there's a bar mitzvah I was at there. It's, there's a synagogue inside the tunnels called the Rabbi Get Synagogue. And this is the Struthion Pool. It's a huge, huge pool that used to be filled with water. It's no longer filled with water because when the nuns discovered there's a way into the basement of their nunnery, they got very, very upset and they built a wall and eventually drained all the water. Um, but it, when uh, Charles Warren went there, he went on a raft inside this holding a candle and uh, he, 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 it's incredibly big. It takes you from the, the Muslim quarter. It takes you basically straight to uh, Temple Mount, but it's a huge pool. Um, this is the pool now after it's been drained out. And this is the wall they built because they didn't want people coming into the nunnery. And uh, that is, the, and here's the rock, which is the largest stone, 45 feet. Uh, it appears to be extremely big. Here's a person, which just shows you how big it is. Um, so yeah, these are things that you wouldn't have known of, but they are under under the, uh, they're in the Kotel tunnels. Um, I believe that brings us to the conclusion of this, but I really welcome any questions, comments, um, whether it's on the earlier parts, the Canaanites, the time of uh, King David conquering the city, the time of King Solomon being anointed, which we've seen. We've seen also uh, Hizkiyahu's tunnel, the amazing, incredible uh, engineering that went on. It went into that all the way down to the creation of the Shiloh pool, Derech Olei HaRegel, the path of those who go up on uh, pilgrimage and uh, to the later to the, um, the Gei Ben Hinom, the, uh, the, the Katefinom, where they found Birkat Koanim. And lastly, although with definitely not enough time as much as it deserves, the second temple, Kotel Tunnels of the Hashmonaim. Uh, so that is it. And, and really, any questions or comments are definitely welcome. Um, and otherwise, I think we will, I'll, I'll, I'll turn this.